Greetings and salutations, friends. Today we are going to go on a twisting sartorial journey from modern pop culture back to 1717 and the golden age of piracy to the Italian Renaissance and back even further still. From the Caribbean to England to Italy and the Ottoman Empire, all to make a robe. Well, not a robe, but we'll get there in a minute. I am, as of this moment, still obsessed with the show Our Flag Means Death. The characters, the dialogue, the production value, the costumes, including this robe, which is first worn by the character Steed Bonnet. No spoilers here, but still my favorite storytelling device. So what was I to do when this fabric turned up on Etsy? Make a piratey robe, obviously. So to sort of shoehorn this into my area of interest, this will be Steed Bonnet if Our Flag Means Death had been set in the 17th century, in England, and also if Steed had been femme. So not really our flag means death at all, but you know what? It's going to be this fabric and a robe, and we're going to channel that big Blackbeard energy. The robe on the show is meant to be an early 18th century dressing gown or banyan. I love banyans, and I feel like they're even useful in a modern context for peak lounging, but I really want to make this robe which is technically a gown. One of those dressy but still cash moments that's kind of the early 17th century Banyan equivalent. This is an English gown from the year 1600, which likely takes direct style inspiration from both Spanish dress and the Italian Zamara. The Zamara went through a style evolution throughout the 16th and into the 17th century, but the Genesis takes heavy inspiration from Islamic dress. Italy and the rest of Europe enjoyed bountiful trade with the Ottoman Empire for centuries, but this relationship was definitely complex. From the outside, it looks mutually beneficial with Italy and the rest of Europe paying dearly for exotic goods from all along the Silk Road. However, humans, there was still quite a bit of exploitation that happened, both in terms of how the suppliers of these goods were treated and compensated, but also in how cultural ideas were then appropriated for European tastes and lifestyles. Ottoman koftans were relatively simple in terms of construction, all the better to showcase the glorious textiles that they were made from. Cloth of gold, intricate jacquards. These koftans were meant to display wealth and power, and likely made their way to Italy as gifts to the powerful families that controlled trade with East. The popularity of these outer garments in Italy was waning by the dawn of the 17th century, but they were still quite popular as a formal but informal look in England at this time. By this time they had evolved a hanging sleeve, which is what we see on the reference garment. It's not really a sleeve, it's kind of a faux sleeve that doesn't really cover the arm, but is another surface to show off some bling. If you caught the preceding research video, you'll know I discovered this gown is featured in the book 17th Century Women's Dress Patterns, Book 2, edited by Susan North and Jenny Tiramani. For me, half the fun of making clothes from history is doing the research and trying to figure out the construction. The flail is the fun, so I'm going to see how long I can go without referencing the very clear, very professional set of instructions that is literally at my fingertips. Instead, I'll be referencing the tried and true Patterns of Fashion 3 by Janet Arnold. There's still a pattern, there's still notes and really good photographic evidence, but there's not the step-by-step -step instructions. So, wish me luck. I'll be reproducing this gown as closely as resources and skill allow. Using the printed scale as a reference, I created a one inch square as a guide to match against the scale grid in the background of the pattern, and scaled the image up about 720%. I then tile printed the pattern, including the fitted upper portion of the front and back body, the inner yoke, sleeves, wing, and collar. I love working with these patterns so directly. Using Janet Arnold's direct patterns with her notes intact is a welcome reminder that we're all just building on each other's research. That's why I make these videos. I often don't really know what I'm doing, but the more process work that is available, the more we can build upon each other. The bottom portion of the pattern is just a rectangle, so rather than wasting printer paper, I taped the fitted upper portion of the pattern to pattern paper, and drafted the bottom rectangle so that the entire thing fit my height requirements which means from the floor to my high point shoulder. The original also has four gores at the sides, which I measured in Illustrator using the line tool and marked out on my pattern paper.
Okay, so I finished my first twall, which is the laziest twall that I have ever made in my life. It's not even sewn together, it is pinned. It's half a twall, so there you go. I'm kind of split over whether I'm going to even make a proper twall since this is an outer garment, hence why it's on top of a gown right here. It doesn't need to fit precisely, it just needs to fit well. It needs to like 75% fit. I could make a full twall since I'm still waiting on the fabric to come from India. However, there is a lot of work to do before the velvet even enters the workroom. The pleated sort of flowy velvet body of the garment is mounted on an internal yoke. That's kind of like an English trifle of thin wool, silk taffeta, and linen buckram that hides all sorts of like tailored goodness inside. The pattern for the yoke generously includes guidelines for all three layers. So you can kind of see what this is meant to look like. <laughs> I'm tempted to only properly twall the yoke since I don't think I can technically properly twall the velvet without actually using the velvet. Honestly, even the yoke, like it's so simple. I mean, I, I feel like I just need to like fit this together and like hold it up against my body and say, yep, that's going to like 85% fit. So I think we're good. Not good sewing etiquette, but I think that this is one of these garments where you just kind of continuously baste throughout the process and, you know, try it on, take it back off, rearrange things a little bit and just I don't know, gradually build it up. Do not know how that line of reasoning is going to work out for me, but here's hoping. <laughs> First cut out the buckram, actually not buckram, but some linen canvas I originally used as a table covering. I used a pin to make holes and marked the buckram pattern by pushing ink through each hole. Ink could have been used historically, but this could have also been chalk or charcoal. I don't know what thin wool means, but in my mom brain, thin wool and padding equals wool felt. The true yoke is made of silk taffeta. I'm using this brick red since I have a lot of it left over from a different project. I've made a net pattern here, meaning there is no seam allowance. The wool padding and linen don't need seam allowance since you wouldn't want all that bulk in the seam, but I added half an inch to the silk. I prefer to work this way when working by hand, since when I trace out the pattern, I'm making a handy guide for my stitching. I will always forget to add seam allowance to at least one of my pieces. Not yet on this yoke, but give me time. I've pad stitched a few early modern garments. All done wrong, but I think I actually may have done it right this time. Janet Arnold so kindly informs us there are 14 rows of tiny pad stitches holding the buckram and wool to the yoke. This may have been done in one fell swoop, but I didn't want to deal with pad stitching through three layers, so I started by pad stitching the wool to the silk. I'm using a fine silk thread for this, as these stitches will be visible on the inside of the garment. As you pad stitch, the fabric is meant to be manipulated a bit. The stitches not only hold the padding to the taffeta, they actually shape the entire piece. My shaping was a bit wonky. <laughs> because it isn't woven, felt likes to warp. I know felt is used in Renaissance tailoring, so inconclusive. I should address this whole buckram slash canvas situation. Buckram is plain woven cloth that's been dipped in a sizing agent to stiffen it up. Historically, this would have been a plain linen dipped in a gum tragacanth. Canvas is not interchangeable with buckram. It's thicker and not as stiff, but I want this robe to be at least somewhat cleanable, and buckram breaks down with any moisture at all. I used the linen thread to pad stitch the canvas over the wool, and was careful to only catch the wool. I resumed using the red silk thread to pad stitch the linen canvas directly to the silk yoke. I find pad stitched pieces to be immensely satisfying.
The yoke is sewn together at the side seams using a back stitch. The seam allowance is basted inwards at the curve along the front, and the bottom is hemmed to the wrong side using a hemming stitch. The yoke is then put aside for a while, because it's done, and our fabric has just arrived. The fabric that launched a thousand robes is this printed cotton velvet with a lively and frankly not even a little bit Jacobian print featuring birds and foliage. The fabric is, as of this video, still widely available on Etsy, and it is glorious. We're gonna need a diagram for this project, so here it is. For fabric economy's sake, I pieced the top of the front panel as it is in the original. I like to use an applique stitch for this. Once the whole piece was cut from the fabric, I marked out the back panel pleats in ink. I then pleated them. I laid the yoke on top just to make sure everything was copacetic, and marked out where the neckline and shoulder slope should be. The pleats get basted in place. Now that the pieces are whole and the back panel is pleated, it's time to put the thing together. First, the gores become mega gore. Then the front side gore is attached. The front and back panels are attached last. All of these long body seams are attached with a felled seam, which was a chonk, but it's what was used in the original, so... Velvet is a special little snowflake, and if you simply plop an iron onto it, the pile will be crushed. To press the seams, I placed a spare bit of velvet pile to pile to give the little fiber some space. Am I the only one who finds gore tips really satisfying? The pleats are permanently held in place with small back stitches that just barely capture either side of the pleat on the front. Now you may think, oh the major seams are all sewn, the pleats are done. The thing is more or less together, she's basically done, right? No. The edges of the robe, meaning the center front edges and hem edge, all need a strip of buckram to keep them straight and true. Oh, and yeah, we're using true buckram now, but more on why in a minute. The buckram gets basted to the inside of the seam allowance using a coarse linen thread. I like to use coarse linen thread whenever the basting doesn't need to be permanent so that I'll be able to see it and pull it out later. The seam allowance is turned inwards over the buckram and basted into place. The original gown had silver spangled bobbin lace around, well, everywhere, 
All that's left of this lace are the threads that held it in place, all snipped and now hanging free since the lace was removed, probably to be used in another garment or a pillow or something, and an occasional broken spangle. The lace I'm using here is not my favorite, but I had this on hand for some reason and I need a lot of it, so just pretend you don't see the clear plastic chain stitch running through it and we'll all be better off. I attached the lace one quarter inch from the edge using a felt stitch. I attached a better lace that I also had on hand one quarter inch from the edge of the first lace. The full perimeter of the gown is about five yards. Each strip of lace has to be stitched twice, meaning that the body alone needed 20 yards of lace stitchery. And spoiler alert, in the Jacobian period, there's always more lace. The buckram is covered with a two inch strip of silk taffeta, which also finishes off the hem. The outer seam allowance is folded and prick stitched to the edge of the robe. The inner seam allowance is folded and fell stitched into place. You may be thinking, that's specific to prick stitch one edge and fell the other. Yeah, I had caved and looked at the instructions by this point. I laid the yoke into place, wrong sides together, and basted it around the edges. I 100% knew this was never going to just magically fit into place, so there was some adjusting here and there, some general fudging, but I knew the yoke fit properly, so I let that be my north star in this process. where the fudging was fudged and trimmed away all the excess velvet. Consider this your warning. Abandon all hope of aesthetic sewing shots from here on out. All's well that ends well, but you're watching this sausage being made if you catch my drift. The shoulder seams were whipped together through all layers. This thick, grotesque seam is covered with a strip of silk taffeta. This was first backstitched to one side, the seam allowance of the other side folded inward and fell stitched down. Hanging sleeves are pretty bad hash. You get all the coziness of a sleeve, but then peekaboo, there's your arm. The sleeves of this robe are, we'll call them eccentrically shaped to a modern viewer. The round shape likely came from Spain, and we can see an example in Juan de Alcega's Libra di Geometria Pratica y Traca, circa 1589. The outer sleeve is fully interlined with the same wool felt as the yoke. The inner sleeve gets a buckram strip at the opening edge and along the back top edge. The seam allowances are basted inwards. And now it's time for Oh no. The sleeves of the original are lined with silk that's been pinked. In 
intentionally making holes in my silk was a first for me, and this whole adventure is getting its own video. But yeah, this was fun. The lining is placed against the sleeve and its wrong sides together, seam allowance pressed inwards, and prick stitched into place. I then whip stitched the upper and under sleeve together along the top 4 inches of the back opening and tacked the sleeve together at the wrist and very bottom inner edge. Time to put the sleeve aside for a moment to make the shoulder wings. Yep, this robe has wings. First off, the pattern, which looks like this in Patterns of Fashion 3, is actually tabs. Not that I cut the whole thing out as one piece of fabric with trim sewn on top and had to redo it or anything. Each wing tab is stiffened with a piece of buckram. The buckram is covered with velvet and the seam allowance basted to the inside. You know this process by now. And yep, afraid so. I used an amazing trim for this that unfortunately has broken down every couple of inches, so using it in little pieces like this was pretty ideal. Since there are 14 of these things, I started making them as soon as the fabric arrived and sewed them whenever I had a spare moment. So this is how, way back in the beginning of the process, I discovered I needed true buckram. You can definitely see the difference. The tabs are attached one quarter inch from the bottom with an unworked bar. I wish sewing the wing and sleeve into place was a fine science. It was very much an art, full process of manipulation and intrigue. I basted the wing first from the inside, then basted the sleeve in the same way. All I can say here is basting is your friend and if it doesn't look right or it sits funny, rip it out and try again. And again. When I finally had everything in place, I whipped the whole lot, the body, wing, and sleeve together in one monstrous whip stitched swoop. Seriously, this seam was the thickest, chunkiest seam of my life and I almost had to get out the pliers. There were places where, with pleating and buckram and lining, it is 10 layers. 10. And I don't think it's wrong or that it could be any less, it's just... Anyway. This monstrous seam was then covered with another silk strip similarly to the shoulder seam. This seems to be their MO. There's a big ugly seam, just cover it with some taffeta. Almost there, friends, we're almost there. And after the sleeve, the collar was downright soothing. The collar gets a layer of canvas, pad stitched to a layer of black wool. This delightfully shaped piece is covered in velvet and... You know what? It's okay, because this is the last bit of trim. Promise. Okay, I ended up couching a silver cord to the edge because this one little trim just looked lonely. The lining was then fell stitched into place except at the neck edge. I fit the collar to its position around the neckline and back stitched it into place from the center out. The lining is then folded over the seam I just made and fell stitched.
This was an adventure. Kind of embarrassed, but I thought this was going to take me two weeks to make. Tops. Four months later, I'm pretty glad I stuck with it. Like, 98% glad anyway. More adventures are already afoot. Luckily, all you need to do is hit the subscribe button. Until next time, adieu.